Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. For our viewers who have been with us for some years, you know from time to time we have the Chautauqua format in which some scholar comes on our program in the character from the past. And so today we're very pleased to welcome to the program Sacagawea's son, John Baptiste Charbonneau. Uh, Mr. Charbonneau was born on February the 11th, 1805, and he's come to our time in the 21st century to talk with us. And sir, welcome to the program from the, and uh, welcome you from the past to be with us at this time. Uh, thank you, it is a pleasure to be here today. Thank you very much, and I'm very pleased to have three panelists to question our uh, distinguished guests from the past. First of all is Janelle Burke, an attorney in the state of Idaho. Next to her is Judy Meyer, who's on the Board of Trustees at North Idaho College and the former chair of the Idaho State Board of Education. And our third uh, panelist is Erna Reinhardt, who's director of public relations at North Idaho College. And with that, Janelle Burke will commence today's questioning. Mr. Charbonneau, uh, this is a landmark anniversary of a trip that Lewis and Clark took in our time, we're celebrating this landmark uh, anniversary. There's a great deal of curiosity about you because you were unique in your position as you made this trek, but there's also a great deal of curiosity about your parents. Please tell us about your parents. Well, uh, of course, my mother was uh, Sacagawea that uh, the people of Idaho know because she was born in uh, Lemhi County and, uh, and was kidnapped and taken to the Minotauri tribe. Uh, that is where my father, uh, Troussan Charbonneau, uh, purchased her as part of a trade with the, uh, he, he, she became one of his wives in a trade with the Indians. And uh, when uh, uh, Lewis and Clark uh, arrived at uh, what became Fort Mandan, they hired my father as, a, as a, uh, uh, an interpreter and, uh, and a guide. And uh, my mother and I then went along on the, the trip. Uh, I, uh, of course, was uh, just a baby at the time and don't remember uh, the expedition, but certainly have, have read about it and heard many stories about it and uh, had an opportunity to, to continue to know uh, uh, William Clark, who adopted me when I was four years old, and uh, I lived in St. Louis with him when I was uh, uh, younger. And, of course, uh, my wife or my life is very well documented. Uh, my mother, uh, it is believed, uh, died uh, when she was in her mid-twenties uh, uh, near the uh, Mandan village. Uh, there's a recording on, in a diary that a wife of Charbonneau's had died, and, and normally those things were not put down in journals, and uh, there was some significance to that for that to happen, and the speculation is that uh, uh, it would have been my mother that would have uh, been buried there. No one knows uh, ultimately what happened to my father. He probably went back up to Canada. Um, just one quick question. How old was your mother when you were born? When I was born, my mother was uh, 16, and uh, she was kidnapped uh, from the Lemhis when she was nine years old. And uh, so she was a, a young teenager when she uh, went on the journey. Judy Meyer. To follow up on, on uh, particularly the history with your mom, since that clearly is part of our interest in, in Idaho and the Lewis and Clark journals, tell us any more that you can about her in that <coughs> since she was kidnapped, where did she feel she belonged? Mm -hmm. And then, as I recall, there were some uh, exciting historical moments when she reconnected with, recognizing as uh, she traveled with Lewis and Clark, right. more of her original home. But she left, was kidnapped yeah. around age right. nine. Right. She, she uh, was a Lemhi, uh, went to the Mandan, was, was uh, adapted into the Mandan culture. Uh, she was no longer a, a Lemhi in their minds, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, she became somewhat of a slave and, uh, and then uh, lived with them. So she dressed like a Mandan. She was not a Lemhi. And there has been some controversy, I understand, in your day uh, of uh, statues that are put together of, of Sacagawea mm -hmm. that she should look like a Lemhi because she was Lemhi. But she really should look, uh, I think, like a, a Mandan or would look like a Mandan because that was the way she would have dressed. That's the way she would have acted and would have been adopted into uh, that society. But uh, she certainly, uh, uh, when she was on the trip and came into Idaho, she started recognizing things. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, uh, chief, the chief of the Lemhi, when they, res when they arrived in uh, this, the valley at Salmon, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, Lemhi Valley, um, uh, Chief Kamehawait was uh, 
her brother, and of course that there was great celebration and in uh, uh, the recognition of uh, of her, and it certainly in he helped the expedition at that time with uh, uh, working with the Indians and wanting to uh, get horses and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Erna Reinhardt, you must have lived a very interesting life. <laughs> <laughs> Because not only were you born to Sacagawea, but then you were adopted by one of the Lewis and Clark ex expedition right. people. Mm -hmm. I'm real curious. I, I want to hear more about being adopted, mm -hmm. but also um, you have a couple landmarks in Idaho that I believe are named after you. So, I I do. You do. I know there. I believe there is a Baptiste Creek or exactly a, a, something like that. But it's the only one of uh, which I am aware of. You the, have a nickname. Uh, Your nickname was Pompeii. Oh. Uh -huh. And there is a Pompeii pillar somewhere ah, in Idaho. Uh, near Salmon, in fact, I think. There you go. So, <laughs> so that's true. <laughs> One might We've done a lot of research yeah. in our old well, age. Well, that's good. <laughs> that yeah, well, is good. Uh, Erna, we might point out that uh, uh, that happened after his death, so you yeah, probably that's not know. I that. know. That's right. I, exactly. uh, I'm still catching up with uh, <laughs> those kinds of things. Go ahead, Erna. So. Tell us about so. being adopted. Be. Well, you know, I, uh, at this point, I am going to cool down, and uh, I am going to take this off and explain to you that uh, people expect me to be talking French Canadian or something because my name is Charbonneau and because I'm, my father was uh, French Canadian or at least one fourth French Canadian but actually when I went to St. Louis I was educated in in schools like any other child in St. Louis. I was adopted at age four uh, by Clark my mother and father after I was weaned brought me down the Missouri to St. Louis uh, and I went to school there. I actually didn't live with the Clarks. Uh, his, his wife, uh, after he had offered to adopt me, his wife was, uh, uh, was not enamored with having a, a Native American child uh, in the family, so I actually lived off, uh, away from the family, but still was considered to be their son from the standpoint of being educated. When I came out of, of school, I uh, decided to go back to the frontier, uh, settled, uh, actually started working for a fur company uh, along the Kansas River and, uh, and Prince uh, Paul Wilhelm from Germany came on a scientific expedition to America. I met him and he was enamored by somebody who was uh, Native American but still fairly well educated and so I went to Europe with, uh, with him for six years and uh, learned languages in Europe and spent a lot of time there. Came back to America, went back out west, uh, was uh, actually a mountain man, uh, an explorer, a, a guide. I uh, was recorded as having driven a, tr a uh, wagon across South Pass for the Stewart Party on the, Louis or on the Oregon Trail, uh, was a guide with the Mormon Battalion from New, New Mexico into California, was uh, the, the Alcalde of uh, San Luis Rey Mission in California, uh, which is a mayor, uh, ultimately uh, then uh, became a gold miner in this and uh, living up in the Sacramento area. I actually died in eastern Oregon uh, on my way up to the Montana fields uh, near Jordan Valley and my, my grave is, uh, you can come and visit my grave uh, right there uh, just across the Idaho border. Uh, I died at age 61 there. Well, it's a lot better to bring you back uh, and be uh, here well, than, than it's to visit your to be grave. Back. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit more about the Lewis Clark expedition because it's in our history been so major about the, the movement into the West. And even though uh, you were still very young when your mother died, certainly there are people within your life and your history that uh, shared much with you. Uh, how influential was she on this trip as, as they crossed the country and met many um, different tribes and then also had great challenges with the weather mm -hmm. and uh, across great mountain ranges? What role did both your mother and father play in making this trip a successful one? Well, I think it was recorded uh, in the journals of, of the many people who took journals. It was not just Lewis and Clark that wrote, but in fact many other members of the expedition wrote about things. But uh, there were many instances where I think my mother actively you know, saved some parts of history. I, I know at one point there was a, a, the uh, one of the uh, canoes tipped over and she saved the journals that were floating away and things so it was that was nothing spectacular but it certainly in our you know I'm sure in your minds today as you look back on that was significant but the fact that she was along and that I was along as a baby uh, changed uh, uh, the feeling of the Indian toward the expedition they knew it was not likely to be a war party for example because war parties did not 
travel with a woman and a baby. Uh, so that changed things significantly. Uh, and certainly from the standpoint of being able to uh, uh, do interpretation and things, she, she was able to help out with different languages that others couldn't speak. Uh, primarily Lemhi, but uh, going through uh, uh, the interpretation was fascinating because it would go it would go from English to uh, French and from French uh, then into uh, you know uh, one of the Native American dialects and that native dialect to another one perhaps and uh, and uh, so the interpretation went back and forth with many different languages being used to make these connections at time and she fit into that as uh, as did uh, Troussaint Charbonneau, my father, uh, in in uh, some of those interpretations. So both your mother and father were so bilingual, that is, that they knew enough different languages and, and, and you know, adaptations of those that they were able to adjust uh, across the country. Exactly. So that is um, very interesting. Were the others on the trip that also were helpful with it? with the interpretation and, and translation, or was it just your parents? Prim well, there were, there were uh, from the standpoint of the Native American languages, uh, 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 that was primarily, uh, well, with my mother and, and, uh, and Troussaint Charbonneau. Uh, the others were Fran for pretty much French was the other language as well as, as English. And uh, uh, most of the, the party obviously had English as its primary language, even those that came from Scotland and places like that that were on the on the expedition, but uh, uh, there were times when there was great difficulty in sign language. Was you know the one thing that was used more than anything else. Thank you, Janelle Burke. I have a question to ask about the way that people traveled in your day. Uh, people traveled great distances without roads or markers to point them in particular directions, and many times without maps. You were a guide. Um, the Lewis and Clark journey traveled all across the country in relatively uncharted territory. Your mother was very young when she was taken away. So how did people know where to go? Well, in a lot of cases, the Native Americans uh, knew the trails to follow because they had developed them. And uh, they were certainly here for a long time before the, the expedition came, first came through, which was the first group of white to be seen by the Nez Perce and, and some of the interior tribes like that. Uh, when Lewis and Clark were, were traveling, they utilized the stars and uh, you know the same navigational methods that uh, they used in the sea, for example. Uh, and in some cases, they used, uh, I mean, the term you've heard, dead reckoning, I'm sure, and that's exactly what they did. They would estimate how far they had walked, or they would look and figure out distances. And amazingly, on the journey, once, uh, once the distances had been added up, that were recorded in the journals, uh, the distance from St. Louis to the Pacific Ocean, they missed by 40 miles having the correct calculation on how far that was, in spite of the fact that they backtracked, went over hills, you know, uh, went north and, you know, back down and those kind of things. Uh, so uh, uh, they just, they lived with that type of thing, whether they be on horseback, whether they be walking, looking at d distances, uh, measuring them in some cases, literally, physically, uh, uh, that was just how those things were done, and uh, because it was done so much, and because they were well trained, certainly through the military, with Lewis and Clark and other members on the expedition, that uh, uh, they they were pretty close in their in their uh, estimations on those kinds of things, because they had just lived with that. And of course, we don't do that today, or you don't, I understand. And landmarks, I would have taken. That's right. Landmarks. Yeah, yeah. Early on, there were landmarks. Of course, they developed the landmarks. You know, at once they had left the. Uh, uh, the Mandan, and uh, that was pretty much how far to the west that uh, the white man had pretty much moved uh, within uh, this part of North America that we traveled through. Judy Meyer. Thinking about your interaction, <coughs> you as a young, youngin, uh, with the Native Americans, I know you would not then remember necessarily how it was for the Lewis and Clark uh, Expedition Corps of Discovery to come over the most challenging Bitterroot Mountains there into Idaho to meet the Nez Perce. <sighs> But I know you've heard stories mm. about how the young Nez Perce first perceived or recognized mm. some f kind of folk that they had never seen before. Tell us what you'd heard. Well, the, uh, the mountains mm. into Idaho certainly were a surprise. In fact, uh, it's my understanding that uh, when Thomas Jefferson sent Meriwether Lewis off on the expedition, he said, there are two things that uh, I anticipate that you will find. 
Number one, that there will be no mountains as tall as the Appalachians, so there shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> and the second thing that he said was, and I, I'm anticipating you might find mammoths and other giant beasts, <laughs> such as we had found the bones of in, in the east, and that's the logical place where they still would be alive. Well, of course, they never found any of those prehistoric uh, animals uh, as, project, as uh, Jefferson thought they might, and uh, the mountains became a real challenge for them and were a big surprise. When they came down uh, into the uh, Nez Perce country, uh, they were starving because they had, uh, they had barely made it through the mountains. And you have to understand there, were th there was a group of th 31 people who had not had, you know, to, for them to live you had to have a lot of food and they were not finding food. So they were almost starving. They came staggering down. And there was a group of Nez Perce youngsters that were the first to see them and they went running back to the tribe and said, you know, there are monsters coming down out of the mountains, their hair is on fire, their heads are upside down, and they have fish eyes. <laughs> and uh, it turned out what had happened was they saw the red hair that, uh, Clark. That, uh, uh, that Clark had, and they thought his head was on fire. They had beards, uh, so they, and the Indians didn't have beards, so they thought that her head must be on upside down. And they, the only blue eyes that they had ever seen were on fish, so they thought that they must have fish eyes because they had not seen those kinds of eyes. And that was the first initial reaction that, uh, that the, the Native front. Americans, <laughs> that the Nez Perce had because they had not seen a white man up to that point in time. But as I recall, your experience as a babe, as well as reports you've now read, were that, that the Nez Perce treated them very well, and once they were past the fearful encounter, right. Well, because they carried so many weapons and, uh, and things of value, there was contemplation. If you talk to the Nez Perce today, uh, they will tell you there's mm -hmm. contemplation to just kill them and uh, take those things and become very mm -hmm. rich in the process. And there was one Indian woman who had returned to the Nez Perce who had been in the East, had told about the white man. They had treated her well, and uh, basically the Nez Perce story goes that uh, this, this Nez Perce woman had uh, uh, Witkiwas, I believe mm -hmm. was uh, the, the name, or something similar to that, uh, had uh, said, uh, don't harm these people, they had been good to me and, you know, and uh, they will not harm you. And so that, according to Nez Perce uh, lore, was uh, what uh, basically saved the expedition at that point in time. And the Nez Perce were recorded by Lewis and Clark as being by far the friendliest of the tribes mm -hmm. that they had dealt with. Mm -hmm. So our Chamber of Commerce did the best job of all. Right? They, that's right. And it yeah. was women. They didn't meet times. the, you know, <laughs> they didn't meet the Coeur d'Alene, so I don't know what they would have okay. said about the Coeur d'Alene. <laughs> we can label those folks so. as editorial comments. <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful, yeah. Judy. Okay, uh, Erna Reinhardt. I'm intrigued with with how everyone survived that journey, and I, I understand from looking back and what we have on the internet, which you probably don't understand very well, but we have a lot of research that we can get I've to heard quickly. Of I've heard of telegraph, is that? <laughs> oh, very close. Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> you suffered a very high fever when you were just a few mm. months old, and they mm. think that you either had the mumps or tonsils, and I'm curious as to how, you know, if there were any, pe any members that, that died from the trip, from the journey, mm. and, and how you guys handled your medical mm -hmm. challenges. We have things now called aspirin, which mm -hmm. solve a lot of problems. I think I, I think I have one in my in my pack of yes, I do. Oh, okay, great. good. <laughs> we uh, the uh, uh, there was on the expedition. There were three deaths. The first one was Sergeant Floyd, who uh, died early on of what is assumed to have been appendicitis, and uh, he's buried, I believe. Uh, in Iowa or Nebraska, I'm not sure, but there, but um, it was early as they were headed up that he became ill, and the speculation is from the symptoms that that's what had happened. The other two were Nez per or I'm sorry, were Blackfeet Indians that were killed on the return trip, uh, that uh, uh, had tried to steal some things uh, when uh, Meriwether Lewis was making a trip up toward Canada, and uh, they uh, ultimately had a shootout with uh, with those two black young Blackfeet. Uh, Meriwether Lewis remembers a bullet going past his ear. He came that close to being shot, and, uh, and but they did uh, have an encounter, and, and the speculation they knew they had killed one of the Blackfeet. The speculation was the other one probably had died, but they hightailed it out of there once they'd had that encounter. Uh, the closest they had to having another death uh, uh, was uh, uh, was a shooting in which uh, Meriwether Lewis, who was wearing buckskin, uh, was uh, out hunting. And, uh, and one of the party, uh, Croissant, who uh, was one of their marksmen but could not see very real well on distances, saw what he thought was an, 
uh, a deer or an elk and shot it, and it turned out that it was Meriwether Lewis who was shot through both cheeks. Now, I'm not talking these cheeks, <laughs> and he spent a great deal of the journey down the Missouri on his stomach because uh, Croissant had uh, shot him. Uh, but uh, that was the closest, I guess, to uh, you know uh, another death uh, on the party. I, you know, uh, when when there was illness, uh, Meriwether Lewis spent a great deal of time in uh, in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, being prepared uh, with Dr. Rush, uh, whose pills became famous at one point in time, uh, to prepare him as best as possible for uh, doing medical work. Uh, the miracle drug, so to speak, of uh, the, the journey was mercury, and uh, they gave extensive quantities of mercury when someone was sick, and uh, uh, today we look back and say, you know, what, I mean, what, what is going on, because I understand that uh, you found that that certainly is not a safe uh, thing to be using. Uh, so uh, that was it, and bleeding was another one where they would actually, uh, because they thought they could get rid of the poison, they would uh, cut somebody and let them bleed for a while to see if they could get rid of it. Uh, it's, it's, there's, uh, the stories I've read and uh, things show that uh, there were many miracles involved with this and very close, many close encounters in, in addition to that shooting. Uh, uh, Lewis almost fell off a cliff one time and was rescued as he hung over the edge and uh, uh, encounters with uh, animals including grizzly bears that uh, decided to go the other way, that type of thing. So uh, that this many people could have done that and come close to starvation as many times as they did and all come back except for one that died from appendicitis is uh, very, very amazing. Mr. Sharbin, uh, as you've indicated on the program already, later in your life <clears throat> you followed that same kind of uh, lifestyle and you went with groups on expeditions mm -hmm. and all. Mm -hmm. uh, in all of that time, um, what were some of the experiences you had? Did you come near death at any time? Did you have illnesses? Yeah. And how did you survive up until age yeah. 61? For, for that time in history, yeah. it was a rather long life. Yeah, well, I actually, I was 61 when I, when I passed away, and that was a, a long life. Uh, uh, I think pr part of it was that I, I, I was not I did not go into the mountains by myself and do some of those things that others did. I certainly had good friends to be with. I knew Kit Carson and uh, and uh, uh, people like that, uh, John C. Fremont. Uh, they were people that I was with. I generally, as a guide, I traveled with a group of people so that uh, you know you had others there when you when you needed them. Uh, when I went across the South Pass, as I had mentioned, uh, with the Stewart party. Uh, that was a, a party that was uh, of actually sightseers rather than travelers, and uh, and two of the members of that were sons of Meriwether Lewis that, uh, or I'm sorry, of William Clark that I had known when I was younger and things. So uh, I found a lot of people that I knew, but uh, probably the closest I came to death, uh, interestingly enough, was in Idaho. I uh, was uh, in eastern Idaho and uh, traveling across to what you call, I believe, the Craters of the Moon area and uh, got lost and was separated from the party and was missing for a week and they had assumed that I had died out there in, in the desert and uh, finally came walking in later on to uh, uh, Fort Hall uh, very much alive and uh, that was recorded in uh, one of the journals that uh, was seen that, uh, of someone who had taken notes at Fort Hall at one point in time and things so uh, probably of, of those re those records that would be one of the times when certainly there was some speculation that I would have have been, uh, had died, but uh, came out very much alive. Thank you. Uh, Janelle Burke. Well, you were a child on this expedition, mm -hmm. um, and, but you had some animals along too. How difficult mm -hmm. was it to travel with children and with animals under those yeah. conditions? And uh, tell us something about the animals well, as well. Well, the, 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 the animal that traveled with us, of course, was, was the uh, Labrador, or Newfoundland uh, dog, uh, 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 Seaman. Uh, and uh, uh, Seaman, you know, was there the whole trip, uh, was, was great help in some cases with uh, chasing some animals but chasing off others that may have been in danger and things. And of course I was the only, you know, uh, child on the trip as far as being the baby that my mother took care of and things that uh, everyone took care of me too, uh, you know, because uh, particularly Mayor, uh, or William Clark, uh, he came up with the name uh, Pomp, which was uh, an Indian name that uh, basically meant little chief, I believe, and uh, uh, and uh, so uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, without much recollection because I was so young at the at the time. Uh, I'm sure it was a, 
a great adventure and uh, one, one of those things that was challenging and again amazing that, that, that having a baby would have, uh, you know, go along on this, uh, would have succeeded the, the way that they did and uh, that uh, I was taken care of appropriately as the rest of them were. Uh, depended on my mother obviously because uh, I, I was uh, actually not weaned until I was four years old so I depended on her for a, a long time. But uh, uh, the, uh, you know, they certainly uh, did have other animals from the standpoint of specimens and those types of things, although most of the live ones were sent back down to Missouri uh, early on in the expedition and uh, the rest of them that were accumulated were uh, shot and, you know, and, and kept. But there were, uh, the, the party uh, identified uh, uh, over a hundred species and subspecies of animal and wildlife uh, and, uh, and almost 200 uh, plants uh, uh, and of which in Idaho, I believe something like 61 were from within the state of Idaho that were new plants that were, were documented. A again, part of that training process that Meriwether Lewis had gone through to understand biology and how you uh, uh, classify plants and animals uh, uh, in those days. Judy, we have about a minute. To, in the wrap up time, tell us as we think about the key people in your life, uh, the last contact you remember with your mom mm -hmm. and your dad and then Clark, because he seemed to be your mentor, mm -hmm. and any other members of the party. Is there any recollections you well, have as you grew up? Well, my mother, uh, <coughs> the only opportunity after I was adopted at age four mm -hmm. would have been uh, when my sister, Lizette, was also brought down to the Clarks. Now, nothing was recorded of what happened to Lizette, uh, but uh, it's in all likelihood, I would have seen my mother at that point in time. My father, there's a recording that both he and I were at a rendezvous in Wyoming at one point in time and may have seen each other, but beyond that, nothing. Uh, Clark, uh, uh, if I was back in St. Louis, might have, have seen him then. And your relationship with Clark, when was the last time you saw him? Uh, the last recorded time to my recollection was uh, actually in my early 20s. Most mm -hmm. of the rest of the time I was out west and, and he wasn't. And you didn't run into any other expedition members? No. Uh, other than his children on the, mm -hmm. on the uh, Stewart party. On that note, we have to bring the program to conclusion, but I do want to introduce uh, the gentleman who has been Mr. Charbonneau on our program, and his name is Steve Gerber, and he is the executive director of the Idaho Historical Society, and uh, we think this format is a wonderful one, and our viewers have always liked it. Our students and faculty and community people at North Oak College, over a seven-year period, we've we used that uh, in the past, and it's a great technique for learning, and we thank you, thank you. Steve, for being here. It's been a, a very informative process. and I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Yes, and, and we hope that we can have others in the future to keep this very important historical account going. And ladies and gentlemen, of course, uh, this is getting very close to the time when there'll be a lot of tension to the Lewis-Clark uh, expedition, and certainly Idaho was a very important part of that process. Uh, with that, we will be closing out today's program, and we'd like to invite you to be with us again next week and invite you to contact us from time to time and give us great suggestions uh, of what you'd like for us to do on the program, and next week we'll move to yet another subject. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station.